anyway. I said, you know, that's an obnoxious question. What you're saying is you couldn't be good looking enough to get somebody to marry you. And uh, your personality is seriously lacking. And everybody knows Methodist preachers don't have any money. So how in the world did you pull that off short? So uh, I'm going to tell you, so a couple of ladies asked me that question right here in this church. Can you believe that? I, so I'm going to tell you how. Patty uh, was operating a sandwich shop, a very popular sandwich shop, owned it in Lakeland, Florida. And uh, we started dating. And so I would fix dinner because she had worked all day and I was retired. So I'd have her come over and eat dinner at my house. So one night I said, look, Patty, the wife, the wife does the shopping. The wife does the cooking. The wife washes the dishes. The wife cleans up the house. She said, will you be my wife? I said, that's a proposal and I accept. Now I could hear the rumblings when I was telling that story. Y'all were getting up on your high heels, ready to throw stuff at me. <laughs> but Patty was brilliant. She knew what to do and say, and I'm glad she proposed to me. <laughs> but uh, anyway, now you know the true story. Goodness, we had the coach here, and now I've got some other special guests that I want to introduce to the Memorial family. I have my daughter and son-in-law and three of my great, my most precious possessions, three of my grandchildren. They're right down here. I want you all to stand up and turn around so the congregation can see you. They live in Brooklyn, New York, and you know they're glad to be here. But we're glad they're here too. I want to read to you just a text out of the ninth chapter of Luke. Jesus said to everyone, all, all who want to come after me must say no to themselves, take up their cross daily, and follow me. Let's bow our heads for a prayer. Lord, I think you've got something to say to us. And I pray that you will bless this stumbling, stammering tongue that I may be able to proclaim your truth to these good people here. We wait for you with that hope and expectancy. In the name of Jesus, the one who cares about us all. Amen. Amen. In one of his pensive moments, William Shakespeare wrote, All the world's a stage. And the men and women are merely players. Well, I'm not one to argue with uh, the bard of Avon, but it occurred to me that the sun, life is like a stage, but it's also like a parade ground. Life is like a parade ground, and there are all kinds of parades on this parade ground called life. You can just stand back and look at them as they surround us. There are parades going to and fro on the parade ground of life. Some of them are just merely going in circles, <clears throat> kind of like a rat race. And all of them are promising a lot of things to us in life. Come and eat and drink and be merry. Uh, this is the way to find life at its best, life at its greatest, life that is most fun and pleasant and easiest. All false promises. There are those parades that have great lights flashing and bands playing uh, that march in life in front of us. And we're tempted to join them time after time almost every day. They're leading us to some proverbial land of Oz. And most of these parades are dead ends. 
And I found out, I have a friend that had a little boy and he didn't have, never had any children before. And so I thought I better give him some advice, counseling. I said, little boys are different from little girls. We'd known that from Mother Goose. What are boys made out of? Snakes and snails and puppy dog tails. And little girls are made out of sugar and spice and everything nice. And there's some truth to both those things, but there's, oh, well, that's not true for some. But I found out some things about little boys, I told him, that you need to know. I said, little boys love to pee out of doors. <laughs> Patty, I may get fined for saying that. <laughs> they also absolutely delight in bodily noises. <laughs> They're just different. And little boys, they've not taught this, I don't know how, but they all make the same noise about cars. Nobody teaches them to do that. They just do it. Now, some little girls do that, too. And they just naturally come up with it. Nobody teaches them that. Then I said, now, you need to know, Charlie, about this little boy. When he gets to be about four or five years old, you're going to be taking him to grandmother's house. And he's going to say the same thing that every little boy and every little girl that I ever knew said when they get about five miles down the road. And that is, how much further? And are we there yet? Yeah. Isn't, isn't that true? If you have ever heard that before, raise your hand. I said, everybody did that. That's good. But then, <clears throat> then I said, when they get to be about 13 or 14, they're going to ask you a question. Why can't I? Everybody else is doing it. You ever hear that too? But you know what happens when we become adults? We say, why can't I? Why can't I join the herd and walk with them wherever they're going? I'll follow the herd because that's what everybody else is doing. And there's some danger in going where the herd goes. Walking, following the herd. I, I spend some time almost every summer in Nantucket, Massachusetts. I have a hard time saying Massachusetts. But uh, this last year when I was flying out of uh, this little airport, I was checking my luggage in and the lady said, uh, what is your final destination? <laughs> My piety took over at that point. And I said, I'm heaven bound and it will be glory for me. And she said, that's fine. But your luggage only checked to Tampa. <laughs> But it just sort of caused me to wonder, what, where, where are you heading? Where's that crowd you're in taking you anyway? Is it to some dead end? Or have you discovered it's the wrong way to walk? Where are you heading with the crowd you're in? Well, just as you think about that, here comes Jesus. And what does he say? If you want to be my disciple, if you want to be my follower, you're going to have to say no to yourself. Take up the cross and follow me. Follow me. Follow my example. Well, this is a season when we begin to think about the grand procession of Jesus. He's moving toward Jerusalem. And we see him as he's in this parade the grand procession, he stops and prays over the city. He cries over the city. You know, I, I can see him there weeping over the city of Jerusalem. Not just the city, but the people of Jerusalem. And I know that he weeps still. He weeps over our city. He weeps over our country. He weeps over our world still. And he weeps over me. 
and he weeps over you. He weeps over your home. And he knows that if you'll follow him, it will make a difference. So that's why he bids us to come away from all that downward stuff and walk with him. But there he goes. After he weeps over the city, he comes into the city. He goes down through the Valley of Kidron and enters into the gates on Palm Sunday. It's the glorious parade. It's a procession in this parade ground of Jerusalem. He is, he's the only float in this parade. And look at him as he comes because he's coming as the Prince of Peace the deliverer of the world. And look at him as he pushes aside the palm branches and pushes aside the crowd because he likes being worshipped. But he knows he's got something greater to do, something more to do than that. And so he pushes through the crowd. He goes through an unjust trial. Think about the unjustness of your life. You have injustice. Well, Jesus had it too, so he understands where we are coming from when we have unjust things in life. And he goes on. He doesn't stop. He keeps going even to the cross. And then he doesn't stop there. Dying for my sins and yours. Dying because he loves us. He wants us to have a new life, a better life. The way out of the crowd is provided through the cross. And so he goes on, though. They take his body down. They put it in a, in a, in a tomb and seal it with a, with a stone. They thought they were through with him, but he wasn't through. This grand procession marches right through the stone and rolls it away and comes out of the tomb. And because he lives, we shall live also. Amen. And he keeps on going. He doesn't stop. And he bids us to come and follow him. And there is a grand procession of all those who have run before us, those faithful followers that pave the way that we might have a church like this, that we, might have a, that we might have the opportunity to be a follower of Jesus too. It's a grand, grand possession, procession. And he says, follow me. Follow me. You think it's easy to do that? You think it's sissy to follow Jesus? You better think again. I found that when I follow him, it's one of the hardest things in the world to do. That's why I keep, keep failing to follow him, stumbling along the way. He says, turn the other cheek. I have a hard time doing that. He says, to love your enemy, come on. That is hard to do. He says, love one another. We have a hard time loving one another in the church. Just think about his demand to love your enemy. And he says, go the second mile, not just the first mile. Do more than is expected. If you're going to follow me, you've got to do those things. And that's not easy to do. And I found that when I try to follow him, I fail time after time after time. But there he is continuously bidding me to come back and follow him still. Get back in line, Riley. You keep wandering off so much. What's the matter with you, son? Come on, step in again. And every time I do that, you know what's great? It's great. I feel his presence next to me, walking beside me as a friend. And then sometimes I feel him behind me, pushing me, saying, don't quit yet. Keep going. Do, go into the deep water. Just keep on. He's pushing me. And then there have been those times in life, those broken, sad hard times in life when lo and behold I have been following him he's been carrying me you know what I mean if you've known a great sorrow in life you know what it's like to be carried by Jesus Lord I'm just about to shout I'm walking with Jesus it's so great come come he says come on Riley I'll carry you when I need when you need carrying I'll push you when you need pushing. 
I'll walk with you when you need a friend. What he does for me, he'll do for you. Amen. I'm so glad Susan's here. When Susan was about, I guess, five, wasn't it, honey? We were living in Leesburg in the parsonage. Oh, you weren't that old, I know. No, no. Anyway, I've always had a, a place at home where I could write my sermons. When I'm at the church, I like to have the door open so that anybody can come see me at any time. But when I'm writing a sermon, I go behind closed doors. I go into my closet and, and I work in a, behind closed doors. And one day when I was there trying to write my sermon in Leesburg, all of a sudden, bang, a door opens and Susan comes bouncing in and she said, Daddy, Daddy, guess what? And I said, Susan, didn't you know that door was closed? How many times did I have to tell you to knock before entering a closed door? You interrupted me. I was in here working on my sermon. And I don't have time to talk with you right now. Now you go on and play and I'll talk to you later. Susan was always a bright-eyed child. Just glowed with happiness and joy and love. And I saw all that disappear. And she said, yes, Daddy, and went and closed the door and left. I went back to write that sermon. And I heard the still, small voice of Jesus say, you think you're somebody, don't you? <laughs> you just broke the heart of that little girl I gave you. And there will be a time in life when you wish she'd just come busting through that door. That time sure has come. And he said, you think that sermon is so important. The people will forget it by noontime on Sunday. <laughs> and then the still small voice of Jesus said, you think you're smart? Do it yourself. So I sat there and nothing, absolutely nothing came. And finally I said, Lord, help me. And he said, not before you make up with that little girl I gave you. So I went into where Susan was playing in her room and I said, Susan, I need to see you in my office for a minute. Can you come back in there? And she, I could tell she thought I was going to chew her out again. And she said, yes, sir. <laughs> so she came in and stood before me. And I said, Susan, Daddy's sorry for how mean he was to you. I said, I, I apologize. And I wonder if you could ever forgive me for what I did. And the brightness came back. And she said, sure, Daddy. Sure, I can forgive you. And I said, well, do you think you could sit on Daddy's lap? She said, sure, I can sit on your lap. And she climbed up on my lap. And I said, do you think you could hug Daddy? I need you to hug me. And she hugged me. Then I said, do you think you could kiss Daddy on the cheek? And she kissed me here. And I said, well, how about over here? And here, 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 and here. And we just made up. It felt so good. It felt so good. A lot better than that meanness that I had. Then I said, Susan, you were so excited. What were you excited about? She said, oh, Daddy. Daddy, guess what? I said, I can't guess, Susan. You got to tell me. She said, guess what? Buffy is a French dog. Now, Buffy was our yellow meat junkyard dog. <laughs> Very ecumenical. He had a little bit of Presbyterian, a little bit of Episcopalian, just a tad of Methodist in him, and a lot of Spaniel. So I said, Buffy is a French dog? She said, yeah, Daddy. I said, how do you know that? She said, because he kissed me on the hand. <laughs> So I said, such 
wisdom. Then I said, Susan, I was writing a sermon. If you could write a sermon, what would you tell the people? And she was ready. She said, oh, daddy. Oh, daddy, I'd tell them. When you get lost, Jesus knows where you are. And he will help you. I've been trying so hard through all these years to preach that sermon wherever God took me. Jesus knows where you are. He knows where I am. When you get lost, he knows where you are. And he will. He will help you. He says, follow me. I'll show you the way home. And he does that for us. And that's the truth. Amen. Amen. Now at this time we have some people going to join the church, right? Uh, are wrong. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Come here, Captain. You're going to introduce the people.